This is a hinge. Question. Was this invented? Yes, obviously. But why do we know? Well, this hinge has a purpose. It is arranged for that purpose. It is for opening a door or something like that. This is a computer. What is the purpose of a computer? The purpose of a computer is harder to define than a function of a hinge. Not because it doesn't have function, but it has multiple functions. The hinge has only one. But generally a computer is made for calculating. So if it has purpose, it's invented. Is that correct? Uh, this is a slinky. It has the purpose of stepping down the stairs. But before it had that function, it was already invented. It was an industrial spring. The inventor of the slinky knocked it over and it stepped on books, his table and then on the floor. So the slinky accidentally got its purpose. So that is possible. This is a rock. A rock isn't invented. It's purposeless. Nevertheless, we can give it a purpose. So when things have a purpose, it's not enough to guarantee it's invented. However, could this hinge have been accidentally invented? Well, no. But why? The reason we know is this hinge has some very precise properties to fulfill its purpose. Those were deliberately arranged, such as the holes, the flat side, and that three pieces fit together perfectly. We count four dependencies before it meets its purpose. The slinky that was accidentally invented already had its properties for something else. Actually, this hinge still doesn't fulfill its purpose. For that it needs something else, like a door. Here is a working hinge. If we would place a door against the wall and we would lie a hinge on the floor next to it, could the hinge be placed correctly, naturally or accidentally? No. Even if we wait centuries it won't happen. Nature will eventually destroy it. The hinge would rust. So what exactly is inventing? Inventing is a process where one recognizes there is a need for an object with a particular purpose. Then the person designs and makes that object. And it is obviously invented when multiple dependencies are met before it functions. Let's take a look at another example. Assume we have a large canyon and we would recognize that there is a need for a bridge. We could just add a concrete slab there and problem solved. But if the gap is too large, it won't hold. So we have to think of something more clever. We can put two poles on each side, then we can tie it to the ground, and next we can build a part of the bridge and tie it to the poles as well. And then we can add the last part and also tie that to the poles. This bridge is invented. And it could not have been not invented. Could nature solve this problem as well? Oh yes! Look! A bridge! Which of these two is better? Well, it's the invented bridge. The one on the right is not even a bridge. It just destroyed the canyon. It even blocks the water. Eventually the water might even flow over this and it couldn't be used as a bridge anymore. But the invented bridge, before it is complete, is useless. Nobody can pass the canyon on this almost complete bridge. This is how we can recognize inventions. There is a guarantee. The invented bridge has five precise dependencies before it works. The natural bridge has only one. When something has a lot of dependencies before it works, it cannot be not invented. We can also edit objects that are already invented. 
we can tune them to make them perform better. Tuning isn't required, it's just optimizing it for a particular purpose. Every addition has a slight effect of improvement, and it keeps on working while it's being modified. But there's also a limit to what can be considered tuning. These two cars look identical from the outside, but they are very not. The left car drives on petrol, and the right car drives on electricity. Can we consider this tuning? No, we can't. We can't modify the engine one step at a time to make it drive on electricity instead of petrol. During the modification it doesn't work. We need to replace the entire engine at once. So the electric engine is a completely different invention than the petrol engine. Any intermediate doesn't work. Even a hybrid car, that's a car that has both a petrol engine and an electric engine, doesn't work with two half engines. It has two complete engines. Half engines don't do anything. And so you can't see that on the outside. Next. Can you tune a car into an airplane? Well, that's doubtful. But can you accidentally tune your car into an airplane? when you did not intend to do so. No, that's impossible. Even if your car would come off the ground somehow, you can't control it in the air when you haven't designed something for that. You'd probably just crash. It can't be considered an airplane. A lot of inventions are a combination of multiple inventions. A wheel on a car is an invention on its own. And even though the car and the wheelbarrow are two completely different inventions, the design of their wheels are the same. Why do we use the same design for the wheel of a wheelbarrow and a car? And why don't we give a wheelbarrow square wheels? Well, because it doesn't work. Is 4 uur 55 en 3 seconden. Adrian, ik heb een wekkerradio gemaakt die kan praten. Als hij dat is geen wekkerradio die kan praten. Wat dan? Dat is een robot. Wat is dat dan niet? Een fotocopie. Wat staat er op? Dat lijkt zoiets als een steen met uh, eigenaardige tekens erop. Hè? Of course, this is fantasy. Putting a clock on the radio doesn't invent a robot. You just saw a bending finger, which isn't very exciting. Nevertheless, you just saw three hinges working together. An interesting thing about fingers is that the muscles are not in your hand. There are only tendons there. It works like a brake cable of a bike. The muscle is actually in your arm, over there. This muscle depends on blood that supplies the fuel and oxygen, and the nerve from the brain to send a signal that tells the finger to bend, and bones to make it solid and give it a useful shape and hinges, and the digestion system to filter the right materials from food and lungs to filter oxygen from the air and precise fuel supplies. If one is missing, this just doesn't work. Without one of these, you cannot bend your finger. And there wouldn't be much purpose to it if we couldn't bend our fingers back again. We can explain how this all works. Scientists have figured most of this out a couple of centuries ago. Actually, they were looking for the human soul. They were looking for the maker. They were looking for God. While doing that, they figured out the anatomy of the human body, which made them wonder, where is God? The scientists ran into a surprise. The human body is a machine. So that means no divine power is needed to explain it. And today scientists conclude that it could have originated naturally.
interesting. Let's do that again. This is a coffee machine. It's a machine. So no defined power is needed to explain it. It can originate naturally. That last one is a wrong conclusion, at least for this machine. Actually, concluding that it is a machine is where operational science ends. The rest is historical science. We know this coffee machine was made by a company called Philips. We can take it apart to look for Philips. But if we do, we won't find Philips. So where is Philips? What were the scientists thinking? Finding God by taking apart a body? That doesn't make sense. You can't find a maker by dismantling a machine. Here you see four completely different machines. But they have one thing in common. They are all obviously created. Should we conclude us included? For a lot of people, this is hard to accept. Why is that? Is that because we can reproduce? Let's see. This is a drone. Engineers are currently inventing drones that can 3D print new drones during their missions. So they will be able to reproduce. Still, the first one must be invented. So that's not the point. So what is the problem? Well, these machines are man-made. The first human being, also a machine, was not man-made. So there's the problem. This is the point where creationists usually start waving with a Bible. Let's just not. We know these three objects are not created simply because we have the natural laws complete and we can observe these things forming without them being created. And we know these are created. We don't need a Bible to figure that out. So is there a way to tell whether or not this is created? Let's put it this way. Can nature invent? According to scientists, all life evolved. Let's see. This is a tiger, which is part of a family of rather different animals, which are probably all the result of one pair of cats. We can actually observe animals changing over time. And we call that evolution. So in that sense, we can say that evolution is a fact. That means we see evolution occurring today. That is operational science. But what exactly is evolution capable of? Let's take a look at that in detail. Look at these dogs. Just like the cats, they differ a lot. But a lot of this is due to breeding. Some dog races are deliberately bred by humans to make them very suitable for a particular purpose. Nature can do that too. That is called natural selection. One kind of animal can change into a great variety. The nature can accidentally select based on a particular purpose. It's a bit like the slinky. Nature can accidentally select a purpose to something that was not intended to fulfill that purpose. But at the same time, it reduces variety. We can consider natural selection natural breeding. So scientists describe evolution as a combination of random mutations plus natural selection. Then we can ask the question, what is the limit of evolution? But it's not really possible to define a limit. But does that mean it's unlimited? Another question, what is the longest possible human jump? 
we can't really define a limit. But is it unlimited? Will we ever be able to jump to the moon? No. So even if we can't define a limit, it doesn't mean it's unlimited. What we should do is take a look at the process of inventing. What happens when you keep on breeding bears to make them fit for a very cold environment? Will they become penguins? No. Bears have changed into polar bears. Penguins also changed. These penguins live in very warm environments of Galapagos while others are now capable of withstanding the colds of Antarctica. For these animals, nature was able to select the best fitting ones. Every new generation was a step towards these extreme types. So nature was able to recognize the improvements. So there we see the result of natural selection. It is natural breeding. In terms of inventing, this is tuning. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Why is this question asked so often? It is because of circular dependencies. The chicken is dependent on the egg and the egg is dependent on the chicken. So which evolved first? We see more of these circular dependencies in nature. Even in the tiniest form of life we can see that. DNA is dependent on the cell that holds it, RNA is dependent on the DNA that codes it, proteins are dependent on RNA that translates into it, and cells are built from proteins. So which came first? And why did it accidentally get a purpose? It, this still hasn't been figured out. We also have examples in nature of multiple dependencies. Blood clotting looks simple, but it is dependent on many different elements in our blood. If one is missing, it won't work. This is similar to the example of the bridge. So in this case, tuning won't do. Blood clotting is an invention. In this case, nature could not have seen any improvement until the invention was complete. Natural selection is insufficient to explain it. Another example. This is a bull. Just like all other land mammals, it has its testicles hanging outside its body. That has a purpose. They must be slightly below body temperature in order to function properly. But whales are supposed to have evolved from land mammals, but it doesn't have its testicles hanging outside its body. That's because the water is too cold for that to work. So the whale has its testicles inside its body. But still it has to be cooled down in order to work. It has a blood vessel that goes to its tail. Then it makes a few turns there to cool down the blood to the right temperature. And then it goes a long way back to its testicles. Over there the blood vessel is twisted around its testicles to cool them down to exactly the right temperature. That's four dependencies. It really is a completely different invention and any intermediate doesn't work. So we can consider evolution tuning but inventing is not the same as tuning. We see lots of inventions in nature. When there are multiple dependencies before it works Nature cannot recognize improvement, and so natural selection could not be the answer. So the sentence, evolution is a fact, means we see natural tuning. It doesn't mean anything more. It's not a fact that evolution can form life from scratch, or that we evolved from a single-celled organism. There simply isn't evidence for that. Survival of the fittest is not the point. Arrival of the fittest is the problem. 